Welcome to the Tech Humanist Show, a multimedia format program exploring how data and technology shape the human experience. I'm your host, Kate O'Neill. Hello, humans. Today, we look at a global crisis that's affecting us all on a near daily basis. No, not that one. I'm talking about the other crisis, the one getting a lot less media attention, the global mental health crisis. In December, Gallup published an article with the headline, The Next Global Pandemic, Mental Health. A cursory Google search of the words mental health crisis pulls up dozens of articles published just within the past few days and weeks. Children and teenagers are being hospitalized for mental health crises at higher rates than ever. And as with most topics, there is a tech angle. We'll explore the role technology is playing in creating this crisis and what we might be able to do about it. Let's start with social media. For a lot of us, social media is a place where we keep up with our friends and family, get our news, and keep people updated on what we're doing with our lives. Some of us have even curated feeds specifically with positivity and encouragement to help combat what we already know are the negative effects of being on social media too long. There's a downside to this, though, which I spoke about with Caitlin Ugalik Phillips, the author of The Future of Feeling, Building Empathy in a Tech-Obsessed World. I wrote about this a little bit in an article about mental health culture on places like Instagram and Pinterest, where you have these pretty images that have nice sayings and sort of the commodification of like anxiety and depression. And it's cool to be not okay, but like then you're comparing your not okayness to other people's. We've even managed to turn being not okay into a competition, which means we're taking our attempts to be healthy and poisoning them with feelings of inferiority and unworthiness, turning our solution back into the problem it was trying to solve. One of the other issues on social media is the tendency for all of us to engage in conversations, or perhaps arguments is a better word, with strangers that linger with us, sometimes for a full day or days at a time. Caitlin explains one way she was able to deal with those situations. Being more in touch with what our boundaries actually are and what we're actually comfortable and capable of talking about and how, I think that actually is a place to start for empathy for others. Because a lot of times when I've found myself in these kind of quagmire conversations, which I don't do so much anymore, but definitely have in the past, I realized that I was anxious about something or I'm really being triggered by what this person is saying. That's about me. I mean, that's pretty common thing in psychology and just in general, that when someone is trolling you or being a bully, it's usually about them. And I think if we get better at sort of empathizing with ourselves or just setting better boundaries, we're going to wade into these situations less. I mean, that's a big ask, I know, for (laughs) for millennials, Gen Z, Gen X, and anyone trying to survive right now on the internet. But social media doesn't make it easy, and the COVID pandemic only exacerbated the issues already prevalent within the platforms. Part of the problem is that social media wasn't designed to make us happy. It was designed to make money. John C. Havens, the executive director of the IEEE Global Initiative on Ethics of Autonomous and Intelligent Systems, elaborates on this idea. Oftentimes, the value is framed in exponential growth, not just profit. Exponential growth is an ideology that's not just about getting some profit or speed. It's about doing this. Well, when you maximize any one thing, other things, by definition, take less of a focus. And especially with humans, that can be things like mental health. This is not bad or evil, but it is a decision. And in this case, it's a key performance indicator decision. The priority is to get something, say, to market versus how can we get something to market focused on well-being? How can we make innovation about mental health? The upside is that our time indoors led some people to more quickly realize the issues with technology and its effects on us. Early in the pandemic, I spoke with Rahaf Harfouche, a strategist, digital anthropologist, and best-selling author who focuses on the intersections between emerging technology, innovation, and digital culture about what she learned about our relationship to technology during that time. 
For me, I think it just amplified a lot of the issues that I had with the way that we were using technology before. I noticed that in my social networks and in my friend groups, people were home more. And so what can we do but turn to our online, to this never-ending content and distraction and connections? And I noticed in the first couple of weeks, everyone was all about the Zoom everythings, and then there was like a Zoom burnout. And for me, I think there's a couple of big issues at play. The first is that we have more bandwidth because we're at home. So we're like consuming more information. A lot of these platforms uh, leverage this like addictive, constant refresh, breaking news cycle. And with something as complex and nuanced as COVID, I know many of us were glued to our screens, refreshing, refreshing, refreshing the latest news. That was not the best thing I could have done for my mental well-being <laughs> or anxiety. It was at one point I was like, I need to take a step away because I'm just addicted to like the news of it instead of actually increasing my information or my knowledge. And the other thing is, I think that for many people, the forced pause made us realize that some of us use productivity as a coping mechanism. So suddenly we had more time. And so I saw people starting to try to make their personal time as productive as their professional time and really pushing themselves to like pick up 10 new hobbies and learn 10 new languages and take 10 new classes. And one or two of those things is great, but I really saw people loading up. And that was a good indication to me of our like lack of comfort with not doing anything. I noticed I was guilting myself for not writing and not learning and not doing all these things. And then I was like, you know what? We are undergoing this immensely traumatic, super stressful thing. It's okay to not do anything. Like, that's fine. If you're anything like me, that's a lot easier said than done. Even if you've mostly resumed your life as normal, you're probably still in the habit of working all day and then filling your free time with more work, hobbies, or time on social media. I asked Rahaf what someone trapped in this cycle could do about it. Your brain needs at least a week to just unwind from the stress of work. If you're just constantly on planes and, you know, in deliverables and client stuff and business stuff, like you're never going to actually take the time to imagine new opportunities for yourself. The trick is we have to balance periods where we're actually producing the thing with periods where I call it intangible creativity. A lot of the mm. thinking you can't see. And in our culture, we don't like things that we can't see. Right. But how many of us have gone for a walk and gotten that idea? or been daydreaming and gotten that idea. And so creatives, we need that downtime. And by the way, like downtime isn't taking a coffee break and then being on social media. Downtime <laughs> is really downtime. It's daydreaming. It's just letting your brain go, which is why we need a different framework because for a writer or for a strategist or for you, for you and I, you like you spend so much time thinking about things. For you to think about things, you need the time to think about them. Most of us don't have the luxury to just shut off our internet usage entirely. If you're someone, like most of us, who needs technology to get by, how do we find that balance? And why is it so difficult? And I think it's because we've shamed ourselves into thinking if we're not doing stuff, it's a waste. And that's the problem. The problem is, is like intentional recovery, deciding and choosing to rest, prioritizing that is really hard for all of us because we constantly hear these stories of CEOs and celebrities and Elon Musk sleeping on the floor of his factory and Tim Cook waking up at 4.30 a.m. in the morning. So you hear all of that and then you think, I can't take a nap. I can't watch a movie. I can't go for a walk because then I'm not like committed to being successful, which is the most toxic belief system that we have incorporated into our society today, especially for creatives. The breakthrough that I had was that it's not actually about systems or organizations. It's about us as people. We are our hardest taskmasters. We will push ourselves to the limit even when other people tell us that we should stop and take a break. If we're going to move to a more humane productivity mindset, we have to have some uncomfortable conversations about the role of work in our lives, the link between our identity and our jobs and our self-worth, our need for validation with social media and professional recognition, our egos, all of these things like battle it out, which is why I just can't come on here and be like, okay, guys, take a break here, do this. Right. We're, we're not going to do it. We really have to talk about growing up. What did your parents teach you about work ethic? How is that related to how you see yourself or who are the people that you admire? And then there's 
statements that you can ask yourself, like, you know, if you work hard, anything is like all these things, you can start testing your own relationship with work. And once you start asking yourself these questions, you start to see that we have built a relationship psychologically, where we feel like if we don't work hard enough, we're not deserving. And not only do we have to work hard, we have to suffer for it. We have to pull all nighters. Look, like think of the words that we use hustle and grind and like all of these horrible verbs. And, and the reason why it's important to dig into that is that oftentimes our views about our work become assumptions that we don't question. So don't we don't ever stop and say, does this belief actually help me produce my best possible work? Or is it just pushing me to a point where I'm exhausted and I'm burned out? The second thing is a lot of the stories that we have been told about success just like aren't true. And I'll give you a super quick, super simple example, which is if there's an equation for success, most people think hard work equals success. But in reality, while hard work is very important, it's not the only variable where you're born, your luck, your gender, your all of these things are little variables that add into the equation. So what I don't like about the hard work equals success is the flip side of that tells people that, well, if you're not successful, it must be because you're not working hard enough. And right. part of the awakening is to understand that there are other factors at play here and we're all working pretty hard. And so we don't need more things telling us that we're not enough and we're not worthy. When I had my own burnout, I knew better, but didn't do better. And that was really frustrating to me. It's like, I have the knowledge. Why couldn't I put the knowledge in practice? And then eventually I realized all of these belief systems and stories, they're embedded in every Instagram meme and every algorithm that asks you to refresh every 10 seconds and every notification that interrupts your time in the design of these tools where we're designing them to make, to socially shame people for not responding fast enough. So like with WhatsApp, for example, you know, the blue check mark that lets you know that the person you've sent the message to has seen and read your message. Like, what is that if not social pressure to like respond? So right. we've also shaped technology to amplify the social norms that if you're left on red, that is a breach of etiquette. So we, as a culture, believe things about success that aren't true. Then we program those beliefs into our technology, and that technology ramps up and exacerbates the speed at which we're exposed to those flawed ideas. It creates a downward spiral for the user, or the person, using those platforms to believe those untrue truths more deeply, broadening the disconnect between our ideal selves and reality. And yet, despite these outside forces at play, there is an urge to place responsibility on the user to say that each of us is solely responsible for our own mental health. Emma Bador Highland, the author of Therapy Tech, The Digital Transformation of Mental Health Care, calls this responsabilization. I draw from the work of Michel Foucault, who writes about neoliberalism too. So the way that I use it in the book is to say that there is an emphasis when we talk about neoliberalism upon taking responsibility for yourself, anything that could be presumably within your control. And in this day and age, we're seeing mental health, one's own mental health being framed as something that we can take responsibility for. So in tandem with this rollback of what would ideally be large scale support mechanisms, um, local mental health care centers and facilities to help people in need, we're seeing an increasing emphasis upon these ideas like use the technology, which you can get for free or at low cost to help yourselves. But at the same time, those technologies literally don't speak to and don't reflect an imagined user, which would be that of the person who we know in this country needs interventions most badly. Thankfully, we live in a world where once a problem has been identified, some enterprising people set out to design a potential solution. Some of those solutions have been built into our technology, with screen time tracking designed for us to think twice about whether we should spend more time on our phones, and Netflix's Are You Still Watching feature that adds a little friction into the process of consuming content. When it comes to mental health specifically, there is a growing telemental healthcare industry, including online services such as BetterHelp, Cerebral, or Calmery. These, however, may not be the solutions we want them to be. A lot of my research is so interesting looking back. My interviews with people who provide telemental health care were conducted prior to the pandemic. It was really a challenge at that point to find research participants, people to interview who were advocates and supporters of screen-based mental health care services. They would tell me that their peers sort of derided them for doing that because of this assumption that when care is screen-based, it is essentially diluted in fundamental ways that would negatively impact the therapeutic experience, which is completely understandable because communication 
communication is not just about words or tone or what we can see on a screen. There's so much more to it than that. But when interactions and communications are confined to a screen and seeing people virtually, you do lose communicative information. One of the things I've grappled with is that I don't want it to ever seem as though I don't think telemental health care is an important asset. One of my critiques of telemental health care is that a lot of the time in our discussions of telemental health, we assume that people already have access to the requisite technologies and access to infrastructure that makes telemental health care possible in the first place. Like having smart devices, even just uh, smartphones, if not a laptop or a home computer station, as well as access to a reliable internet connection in a place where they could interface with a mental health care provider. So a lot of the discourse is not about thinking about those people whatsoever who due to the digital divide or technology gap, even using technology couldn't interface with a mental health care provider. And then some of my other concerns are related to the ways that our increased emphasis and desire to have people providing screen-based care also are transforming persons who provide that care, whether they're psychologists, psychiatrists, uh, licensed clinical social workers, into members of the digital gig economy who have to divide up their time and increasingly burden in some ways and work in ways where their employment continues to be increasingly tenuous. And then relatedly, I am also worried about platforms. So I know a lot of people are becoming more familiar with the idea that these platforms exist, that they can go to, they can visit them on their devices, on their laptops, if they have those technologies, um, and then be connected with service providers. But as we've seen with what's happened with Crisis Text Line, which I know we're going to talk about today, there are a lot of reasons to be concerned about those platforms, which become hubs for collecting and aggregating and potentially sharing user data. So while I think telemental healthcare services are important, what I would like to see is dedication of resources, not just to technologically facilitated care, but using technologically facilitated care to simultaneously direct resources to in-person care as well. We know due to the COVID pandemic, we saw so many people solely offering services that were screen-based for good reason, right? a lot of clinics that provided healthcare services for persons without insurance or who um, are living considered in poverty, who make less than $30,000 a year in their households relied upon in-person clinic services, and they haven't been able to get them due to their shuttering because of the pandemic. So I, I worry about the people who we don't talk about as much as I worry about the negative consequences and effects of mental health care's technologization. So while some people's access to mental health care has increased with technology, many of the people who need it most have even less access to help. On top of that, the business model of these platforms makes it so that healthcare professionals have to work harder for longer in order to make their living. And on top of all this, as a means of sustaining the companies themselves, they sometimes turn to sharing user data, which is a major concern for myriad reasons, one of which is people who use that data to create predictive algorithms for mental health. Next, Emma elaborates on this concept. People have been trying this for a number of years, aggregating people's public social media posts and trying to make predictive algorithms to diagnose them with things like ADHD, depression, anxiety. I'm still unsure how I feel about trying to make predictive algorithms in any way that might try to make predictions about when people are likely to harm themselves or others simply because of how easy it is to use that type of software for things like predictive policing. Um, I write in the book as well that people want to harness internet data and what people do on the internet and social media to try to stop people from violent behavior before it starts. So it's very much a slippery slope. And that's why I find data sharing in the realm of mental health so difficult to really <laughs> to critique because of course I, I want to help people, but I'm also concerned about privacy. For those saying, but what about the free services, things like Crisis Text Line or Trevor Project? Crisis tax line when it comes into fruition in 2013, and it says we can meet people where they are by allowing them to communicate via text when they're experiencing crises. I think that's a really laudable thing that was done and that people thought it was an intervention that could save lives. And based on the research um, about crisis tax line from external researchers and also their own internal researchers, we know that that is the case. But for people who might not be aware, crisis tax line doesn't put people using the services even in contact with professional mental health care workers. Instead, it is people who often have no training or background in mental health care services and instead go through training and serve as volunteers to help people in moments of dire need and crisis, of course. In Therapy Tech, I also describe how I, I perceive that as a form of exploitative labor because although in the past there were discussions about whether or not to provide financial compensation for volunteers, they ultimately decided that by emphasizing the sort of altruistic benefits of volunteering, that sort of payment wasn't necessary. And then I 
compare that to even Facebook's problematic compensation of its content moderators and the fact that those content moderators actually filed a lawsuit against Facebook, although it hasn't been disclosed what the settlement was, at least there's been some acknowledgement that they experienced harms as a result of their work, even if it wasn't volunteering. So I do take some issues with crisis text line. And then in relation to this idea of neoliberalism and responsabilization, again, I think that crisis text line is not the ultimate solution to the mental health care crisis in this country or internationally. And crisis text line has also created international partners and affiliates. I underwent training for a separate entity called Seven Cups of Tea, which is both a smartphone app as well as an internet accessible platform on a computer. And Seven Cups of Tea's training compared to what I know crisis text line volunteers have to go through is incredibly short and I would characterize as unhelpful and inadequate. For me, it took 10 minutes. I can't imagine it would take anybody more than half an hour. Um, And so the types of things I learned from that training were how to uh, reflect user statements back to them, how to listen empathetically, but also not provide advice or tell people what to do because you never know who's on the other end. And at the time I conducted the research, I went ahead and I started to volunteer on the platform. And um, a lot of the messages I got were not from people experiencing mental distress necessarily, but from people who just wanted to chat or people who kind of wanted to abuse the platform. But even though I only had a few experiences during which I felt as though I was genuinely communicating with people experiencing mental distress, I I still found those experiences to be really difficult for me. That could be just because of who I am as a person. But one of the things I've realized or feel and believe is that my volunteering on the platform was part of a larger scale initiative of Seven Cups of Teas to try to differentiate between who would be willing to pay for services after I suggested them to them because of my perception of them experiencing mental distress and those whose needs could just be satisfied by like being mean to me or maybe just having their emotions reflected back to them through superficial messaging. I very rarely felt that I was truly able to help people in need and therefore I feel worse about myself for not being able to help people in need as though it's somehow my fault related to this idea of individual responsibilization. Me with my no knowledge or or maybe slightly more than some other volunteers feeling like I I couldn't help them as, as though I'm supposed to be able to help them. I worry about the sort of fatalistic determinism types of rhetoric that make it seem like technology is the only way to intervene because I, I truly believe that technology has a role to play, but it is not the only way. Technology isn't going anywhere anytime soon. So if the products and services we've built to help us aren't quite as amazing as they purport themselves to be, is there a role for tech interventions in mental health scenarios? Emma explains one possible use case. I think that technologies can help in cases where there are immediate dangers. Like if you see somebody upload a status or content which says that there is imminent intent to self-harm or harm another person, I think there is a warrant for an intervention in that case. But we also know that there are problems associated with the fact that those cries for help or however you want to describe them are technologically mediated and they happen on platforms because everything that happens via a technology generates information, generates data, and then we have no control depending upon the platform being used over what happens with that data. So I I would like to see platforms that are made for mental health purposes or interventions to be held accountable in the fact that they need to be closed circuits. It needs to be that they all pledge not to engage in any data sharing whatsoever, not engage in any monetization of user data, even if it's not for profit. And also, of course, to have very clear terms of service that make very evident and easily comprehensible to the average person who doesn't want to read 50 pages before agreeing because we assume that they're in need if they're using these tools already that they won't share data or information. Now, I do like to close my show with some optimism. So first, let's go to Rahaf once again with one potential solution to the current tech issues plaguing our minds. To me, the most important things we need to tackle, and I mean, I don't know why we can't just do this immediately, is I think we need to have the capacity on any platform that we use to turn off the algorithm. Having an algorithm choose what we see is one of the biggest threats, because I always ask people, think about all the information that you consume in a day, and think about what percentage of that information was selected for you by an algorithm. We need to have an ability to go outside of this power that this like little 
little piece of code has to go out and select our own information or start holding companies accountable to producing information that is much more balanced. And that sounds like a great solution. But how do we do that? We don't control our technology. The parent companies do. It's easy to feel hopeless. Unless you're my friend David Ryan Polgar, a tech ethicist and founder of All Tech is Human, who's here to remind us that we aren't bystanders in this. I asked him what the most important question we should be asking ourselves is, and he had this to say. What do we want from our technology? This is not happening to us. This is us. We are part of the process. We are not just like magically watching something take place. And I think we oftentimes forget that. The best and brightest of our generation should not be focused on getting us to click on an ad. It should be focused on improving humanity. We have major societal issues, but we also have the talent and you know expertise to solve some of these. And, And another area that I think should be focused on a little more is we are really missing out on human touch. Frankly, I feel impacted by it. We, we need to hug one another. We need to shake hands as, as, as Americans. And I know some people, you know, would disagree, but we need warmth. We need presence of somebody. And if there was a way that we ended this conversation and like we had some type of haptic feedback where you could like pat me on the shoulder or something <laughs> like that, everybody right now is an avatar. So I've got to, I've got to have something to say, like, Kate, you and I are are friends. We know each other. So I want a greater connection with you Mm -hmm. than, than with any other video that I can watch online right now. Mm -hmm. You are more important than that other video, but right now it's still very, very two dimensional and I'm not feeling anything from you. And I think there's going to have to be a lot more focus on saying, how can I feel this conversation more? Because, I mean, listen, people are sick and tired right now of, like, not another Zoom call, you know? But if, if there was some kind of feeling behind it, then you would say, okay, I feel nourished. Whereas right now, you, you sometimes feel exhausted. We're not trying to replace humanity, but what we're trying to always do is, no matter where you stand on an issue, at the end of the day, we're actually pretty basic. We want more friends. We want, we want more love. They're actual base emotions. And I think COVID has really set that in motion to say, hey, we can disagree about a lot in life, but what we're trying to do is get more value, be happier as humans and be more fulfilled, be more kind of educated and like stimulated. And technology has a a major role in that. And now it's about saying like, how can it be more focused on that as opposed to something that is more kind of extractive in nature? Whether we like it or not, the internet and digital technology play a major role in our collective mental health, and most of the controls are outside of our hands. That can feel heavy or make you want to throw in the towel. Those feelings are valid, but they aren't the end of the story. I asked David for something actionable, and this is what he had to say. Get more involved in the process. Part of the issue is we don't feel like we can, but we're going to have to demand that we are. And I think a lot of this, frankly, is going to come down to political involvement to say that we want these conversations to be happening. We don't want something to be adopted and deployed, right, before we've had a chance to actually say, what do we actually desire? So that's the biggest part is that everybody needs to add their voice because these are political issues. And right now, sometimes people think, well, I'm not a, I'm not a techie. Guess what? If you're if you're not a smart all the woman, more reason you know, we need to. <laughs> right, well, right. Exactly. We we need everybody. Technology is is much larger. So technology is society, right? So it's like these are actual social issues. And I think once we start applying that, then we start saying, yeah, yeah, I can get involved. And that's what we need to really do. I, I think as a society is like get plugged in and be part of the process. There are a lot of factors that contribute to our overall sense of happiness as humans. And although it may sound like a cliche, some of those factors are the technologies that we use to make our lives easier and the algorithms that govern the apps we thought we were using to stay connected. But that doesn't mean things are hopeless. If we keep talking about what matters to us and make an effort to bring back meaningful human interaction, we can influence the people building our technology so that it works for our mental health instead of against it. Thank you for listening to The Tech Humanist Show. This episode was produced and edited by Chloe Skye, with research by Ashley Robinson and Aaron Daughtry at Interrobang, and with input from Jupiter F. Stone and Elizabeth Marshall. You can find more information about the show's guests and links to their projects at thetechhumanist.com, where you can also find more episodes, or you can subscribe at iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. Special thanks to all of our guests for lending their voices and ideas to help make the future a brighter place. I'm Kate O'Neill, 
and you've been listening to the Tech Humanist Show from KO Insights.